And so I would want to start by welcoming uh, Dr. Mariam Badawi, who will do two presentations, one on the clinical presentations and later on will help us uh, on the benign uh, breast diseases presentation as well. So welcome, Mariam. Thank you, Dr. Ojuka. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is uh, Dr. Mariam Badawi. So uh, I'll do the first presentation now, and then the other one uh, once Dr. Mbuvi and, Dr. and Professor Mushiri have done theirs. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes, we are seeing. So I'll, uh, I think I'll, uh, I have 10 minutes for this presentation, so it will be brief. Um, I'm starting with a case scenario. Oh, sorry. So a 34 year old female, para one plus zero presented with a two week history of a left-sided breast mass. She has no known family history of breast cancer or any other cancer. She uses oral contraceptives on an on and off basis. On examination, she was found to have a two by four centimeter firm breast mass at one o'clock position. That is three centimeters uh, from the nipple. It's not attached to the skin or the chest wall and she has no palpable axillary lymph nodes. So this will just be um, like an intro. So uh, I believe there was another talk about uh, breast cancer statistics. So I will not dwell on it. We all know that breast cancer is currently the most common cancer in women worldwide. And that includes in Kenya, where the, in the incidence in Kenya is actually at 12.5%. And uh, it is the third most common cause of cancer deaths in Kenya, followed, following esophageal and cervical cancers. As opposed to the West, it follows um, colon cancer and lung cancer. In our setup, it's esophageal, it takes number one, and then cervical cancer, then breast cancer. So what are the symptoms of breast cancer? First of all, uh, we need to know that delayed presentation is actually common in our setup as opposed to uh, the Western population. And um, more than 70% of patients actually present more than three months after noticing their symptoms. This is based on a study that was done actually at Kenyatta that looked at uh, about 166 patients uh, with breast cancer and they noticed that 73% of the patients had presented more than three months after noticing their symptoms. And many other studies would tell you that many of our patients come in when they are in stage three or stage four. The mean age at presentation based on this study was 47. However, I had done a recent study and the age at presentation was actually at 42. So it seems like we are getting younger and younger women with breast cancer. This other study was done in 2010, mine was in 2019. And the most common presenting symptom remains to be a breast mass that is uh, uh, for about 87 to 93% of patients. So after the breast mass or together with the breast mass, you can have patients presenting with skin thickening that would tell you that their skin has changed it's become thicker or a bit maybe rubbery, or they would tell you it has a bit of dimpling, or they may actually come with a wound when it's um, locally advanced disease. And other patients may present with a nipple discharge. And the most um, suspicious of nipple discharges is one that is unilateral. It comes out spontaneously and comes out from a single duct and one that is bloody. Now, this doesn't mean that other nipple discharges are not suspicious. You have to treat all nipple discharges the same. That is, the evaluation remains the same. However, when these characteristics are there, it is more suspicious of breast cancer as opposed to the others. Other patients may have an axillary mass. Now, we all know that the breast extends into the axilla in, in the form of the axillary tail. 
and the, the mass may actually be quite up into the axilla or it may be lymph nodes that are enlarged and matted and are felt like a mass. So the patients wouldn't tell you that they have enlarged axillary nodes, but they would tell you they have this mass in the armpit. Others with locally advanced disease would have nipple retraction uh, and uh, some other nipple changes like Paget disease. Now Paget disease would present as a scaly or vesicular and ulcerated lesion. This is commonly mistaken as eczema of the nipple and many patients are missed out on the diagnosis of cancer because they are being treated for eczema, yet the reality is that they have breast cancer. And it may be associated with an underlying breast mass, but it may, it may be too small to be palpable and it may present much later. So usually it starts at the nipple itself and then it spreads towards the areola. Now pain, it usually accompanies the other symptoms. If, if uh, the patient especially has like a uh, skin ulceration, it would obviously be painful. But for a patient to present with pain alone, for it to be cancer, it's, it's usually, it's unlikely. And now other patients may present also with symptoms of metastasis, like they would have back pain, bone pain, or they may even have pathological fracture. And they, that may actually be the point where they are being diagnosed of breast cancer. They may have uh, abdominal pain. They may even be in what we call a visceral crisis. That is when they have symptoms of uh, liver metastasis or um, lung metastasis. So when they're being symptomatic, they have chest pain, they have coughing, all those things. You do the chest X-ray or a CT scan and it shows metastasis. So some patients actually may present like that. Now, the important points to be taken when a patient presents with any breast complaint, whether it's a mass or any of the other symptoms, is you need to ask about any personal or family history of breast or ovarian cancer. You need to ask about a previous history of a breast mass of any kind and how it was managed, if it was there. And uh, the use of hormonal contraception and hormone replacement therapy and also about their obstetric history, that is uh, their menarche and the age at the first live birth. Because as we know, the, the longer the interval, the higher the risk of uh, breast cancer in such women. And uh, some research has also shown that women who have night shift work like ourselves are at a higher risk of getting breast cancer than women who get adequate sleep at night. And also the usual that is tobacco and alcohol use because research has also confirmed that smoking and alcohol intake increases the risk of breast cancer. So all these things need to be captured in the history taking when evaluating any patient suspected to have breast cancer. Now, what are the signs of breast cancer? These are things that uh, the symptoms are the things that the patient presents with, but what do we see as doctors or nurses when we see these patients? Obviously, we'll, if there's a mass, we'll feel it. It usually feels hard. It's usually not very mobile in the breast and uh, it doesn't have regular borders and it may be attached to the skin or the chest wall. But this is not a must. I mean, this is more when it is locally advanced. And you will notice the skin changes like the pud orange, that is the apple, uh, the, sorry, the orange peel um, appearance. And uh, you will see the fixation or feel the fixation to the skin or the chest wall when you're examining that breast. And Paget's disease also, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. This is how it looks. This is how it starts. And then it spreads towards the areola, like we said, to look like this. So it can look quite benign, but in fact, the patient may be having breast cancer. Other signs, of course, during the examination, we have to examine the lymph nodes and uh, the first lymph nodes would be the axillary lymph nodes and they may or may not be palpable. 
And, uh, and then we examine for signs of metastasis. That is when you do your systemic examination, examining the abdomen, examining the chest, listening to uh, air entry and palpating the bones, especially of the spine for any tenderness. So this is just a summary and image depiction of the, some of the signs and symptoms that we see. So once a patient comes with the symptoms and then you see the signs, you need to do what we call clinical staging. Now clinical staging, we follow the TNM staging, that is tumor, nodes and metastasis. So first, as you examine the mass, like I mentioned in the, in, the other, uh, in the other scenario, you have to determine the diameter in centimeters or in millimeters, and then the location on an o'clock position, like so, and then the distance from uh, the nipple, because this is important for documentation purposes. And especially when you're seeing this patient to, for imaging, you write such information on the request form so that the radiologist can look at it and correlate with the imaging that they do. Because they may find another mass that's not what you palpated and they need to report on both and they may correct whatever information you had missed from your clinical examination. So um, this is how you document about the mass. And then you do your axillary examination. When you examine the axilla, you need to determine whether they're enlarged or not. And if they're enlarged, are they mobile or fixed? And if you have enlarged supraclavicular lymph nodes or not, because all these come in in your nodal uh, staging. And then um, now, sometimes you may not feel axillary nodes, but the imaging would tell you that there are some enlarged axillary nodes and they may seem suspicious on imaging. And these would also be included in the clinical staging of these patients. And then this is how we document the TNM staging for these patients. So um, the T stage, is, it goes from T1 to T4 and they all have uh, subtypes, especially the T1 and T4 based on how much of the, is it the skin or the chest wall that's affected? And for the T1, it, is, it depends on the size of the mass. If it's uh, from 0.5 to one, and then from one to 1.5, uh, but they all fall under T1. For the lymph nodes, it's either you have no metastasis, uh, to, no lymph node enlargement, let me call it like that, and then N1 would be uh, movable ipsilateral axillary nodes, N2 would be fixed lymph nodes, and then N3 when you have supra or infraclavicular lymph nodes as well. Now this nodal staging changes when you do it pathologically uh, after you've removed the breast and the axillary nodes. So, we go back to our case scenario. This is how uh, we had written our clinical examination. Like I said, it needs to be clearly documented. Now, the breast ultrasound for this patient, because she was 34, so she was sent for a breast ultrasound, it showed a virus 4 lesion and a core biopsy confirmed invasive carcinoma. More on this, on the BIRADS and the core biopsies will be discussed by the other panelists in the following presentations. So the take home message is that with any patient who comes with a breast symptom, whatever it is, even if it's just pain, you always have to exclude cancer because like we said, breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women worldwide. And sometimes, this le these lesions may not actually feel malignant like we've learned, as in they may not be as hard, they may be very mobile, but indeed they have some foci of cancer. So do not assume from your clinical examination that you can determine for sure this mass is benign and we can just excise it. The triple assessment is very important to assess a patient's breast symptoms and signs. And I'm going to talk more about the pre-triple assessment 
in the, in the second presentation. And we all need to encourage patients on early detection and treatment because we all know that um, early detection and early treatment improve survival. And remember, men can also get breast cancer. So if the patient is male and has any breast complaint, again, we need to exclude that it is breast cancer. These are my references. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Ojuka. Thank you, Mariam, for that good presentation. I think we will have questions at the end of the presentation, but I think next uh, presenter would be Dr. Mbuvi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Dr. Oduka, kindly allow me to share my screen. I, are you, are you, I thought you are, are you able to present? No, I want you to allow me to share my screen. You can't present right now. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Just a minute. Sorry. Now I'm going to tackle uh, breast imaging. My name is Dr. Mbovi. We prepare this presentation with um, my colleague, Dr. Bonaz. And I'd like to appreciate Dr. Mariam for that uh, wonderful presentation in taking us to the clinical history, which lays the foundation of, of breast imaging. So the outline I'm going to follow is to look at a brief anatomy of the breast, the various breast imaging modalities available, indications for the various modalities, a look at Bayard's classification, the various intervention procedures available, and the challenges we encounter in breast imaging and how we can sort them out. So the breast is composed of 15 to 20 lobes. Each lobe is divided into lobules, which form the basic structural unit of the breast. The lobules contain glandular elements, which drain the ducts, the interlobular stroma, and the connective tissue. These breast elements form part of the breast parenchyma and participate in the hormonal changes that take part in the breast. The lobules will, increase, will decrease in size with increasing age and also will reduce after pregnancy, a process called involution. The acinas join to form multiple ductules, which form, uh, which form around 15 to 20 ducts in one lobe. The lobes are incompletely separated from each other by Cooper's ligaments, and in between, they, are, they contain fatty tissue and more connective, connective tissue. So this is a line diagram just showing the, the anatomy that you know of the breast. You have that the breast with the glandular tissue, with the fatty, fatty tissue also, the connective tissue in between, and you have the posterior wall formed by the pectoralis muscle and the fascia. You still have the ribs and the intercostal muscles. So that's a line diagram just showing the basic anatomy. The lymphatic vessels drain laterally into the axillary nodes, which form the larger percentage of the, of the drainage of the breast and medially into the internal mammary nodes, forming around 25% of the drainage. Most of the, uh, most of the lymphatics drain into the axillary nodes and hence the importance of evaluation, evaluating the, the axilla. This is also a line diagram just showing the, the, the drainage, the axillary nodes, the various levels, the infraclavicular nodes and the supraclavicular nodes. It's important to depict them during during the clinical exam and also when you're, when you're imaging. It's important to mention whether these uh, nodes are involved because they affect the management of the, of the patient. So there are many imaging modalities available. 
Some of them, we have them within the private hospitals, within the government hospitals, and some within outside the country. So there are those ones that involved radiation, the conventional mama, which we all know about, the digital tomosynthesis, contrast enhanced mammography. All these help in depicting the masses that we see or the various pathology that we see even better. There's ultrasound, which can be done in various modalities. The common one we know is ultrasound, uh, common ultrasound. We can also have those ones with contrast um, enhanced to depict the mass better, color Doppler, power Doppler elastography. There's also MRI with contrast and also with diffusion weighted. And then there are also these other modalities, the PETs, and the, some of them even undergoing, still in the process of um, being developed. So I look at the breast imaging modalities as far as screening and diagnostic, those modalities that we use for screening and those ones that are used for diagnosis. Um, when you're screening, mammography is the main tool that we use in a, a screening because it's expensive, it's inexpensive, it's um, easily available, simple to perform, especially when you have experienced personnel, it's non-invasive, reproducible and cost effective. Other screening, um, other adjuncts to, to mammography include ultrasound, which is done especially for the dense breasts and in an inconclusive mammogram. You want to uh, further evaluate the patient using ultrasound. And we also use uh, an MRI, depending on the risk stratification of the patient. Those one with BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, those ones who've had radiation to the chest, Regardless of the age, we can consider doing a screening uh, MRI just to evaluate for any, any breast masses. So the diagnostic modalities we have are mainly ultrasound, mammogram with the digital uh, breast tomosynthesis, the MRI breast. Those are the main modalities that we use to evaluate the breast. For staging, you can use MRI. In fact, for staging, initially we start with contrast uh, CT which can be CT of the chest, the abdomen and pelvis to look for any metastasis. CT of the chest, we need to give contrast so that we can be able to look for any nodes, whether the, there is a breast mass, whether is it enhancing, not to evaluate the mass, the breast mass itself, but the mediastinum. So contrast is important. Same to the abdomen and pelvis. And we start from the thoracic inlet all the way to the level of the proximal femora. Should be able to demonstrate all that. Patients who are not able to have a CT, for whatever reason, maybe renal problems, you can do an MRI. And even depending on what, um, what other pre presentation the patient has, bone pains and all that, a bone scan can be done, even a PET scan. And staging will also depend on what the patient presents. For example, a patient known to have malignancy comes with convulsions, new onset convulsions, you can do a, a, a head CT. So the staging, Mainly, other uh, we can add other areas of imaging depending on what the patient presents with. For screening, the indications of screening is mainly women who are above 40 years. It's mainly done on women who are above 40 years with no complaint in terms of they don't have any um, masses, any presentation. So, and it's also done for women with positive family history of breast cancer, especially the first degree female relatives. Uh, we also do it for surveillance screening of the contralateral side for those who've had previous breast cancer. And also, uh, if somebody has had radiation to the chest, for example, for Hodgkin's disease, that person also has a high probability of developing breast cancer. So we do screening for women who have undergone that. And the main uh, screening tool I would like to emphasize is mammography, and it's done to look for small non-palpable abnormalities, something that still has not, is not, you cannot be able to feel it clinically. The other populations who are at a higher risk because of their genetic predisposition, those ones with uh, BRCA1 and BRCA mutations, those ones also, we need to start screening them at, at a younger age. And an MRI is recommended to supplement screening. We start at 25 years. And we can also do an additional mammo, mammogram after 30 years. Those also with a strong family history of breast cancer, even when there's no known genetic mutation, we also consider them to be high risk and need to be screened, possibly even at a higher, at, at a younger age. 
the number of family members with breast cancer, say several sisters, several um, uh, grandmother, a mother, those ones, you need to start, um, you need also to emphasize that they need to start screening early. So mammography is a specialized type of X-ray, which is used to evaluate the breast and it plays a central role in detecting breast cancer. Those changes that you are not able to see, some of them we are not able to palpate. The patient cannot palpate them. The cl clinician also cannot palpate them. So we use a, screen, a screening mammogram. And despite doing um, a proper examination, there are still some, a ten, some percentage, 10% of cancers, which you cannot be able to detect even after doing mammography. Uh, especially in patients who have dense breasts. So there's still a small percentage, even after doing a mammography, whom we are not able to pick up those uh, small lesions. So the views that you normally do are two. They are bilateral, uh, medial-lateral oblique, and the craniocaudal views. And um, just to emphasize that in the higher risk group, Mammography should start earlier, 10 years younger than the, uh, the youngest case in the family. Let's say the, uh, the mother was diagnosed with cancer at 40. We can start screening the lady at, at 30, uh, but we should not start, um, we should not use mammo earlier, uh, uh, later, uh, younger than 25 years. We need to start at least when the patient is 25 years and above. Then we can also use um, supplementary screening, especially the MRI with contrast, enhanced MRI, just to be able to pick up um, any lesions that might be present in the younger, in the, the high risk group. And ultrasound can also be considered for those who are not able to undergo MRI for whatever reason, maybe they are claustrophobic or they're not able to stay still in the, in, the, in the MRI when it's being done, we can consider an ultrasound as a, as a supplementary. But the main um, tool for imaging is just a usual um, mammogram done in two views, the MLO and the CC views. This was just uh, to show how the, position, the positioning of the patient when you're doing the, the, the examination. When you are, the, this is the ultrasound machine. The breast is placed like this, anterior posterior, and pressed from up to down so that we can get, uh, we can get the craniocaudal view. And then also the, for the positioning for the mediolateral oblique view. Those are the standard views that we obtain when you're doing the, the screening mammogram. And also for the diagnostic mammo, we also do these two views as the uh, baseline views. So this is what we get after doing the, the craniocaudal view. You can see this is um, the, you can even see the pectoralis muscle well positioned. You can see the nipple in profile and the density of the breast is fatty. So basically if there's any lesion here, it's very easy to pick. This is the ideal breast, but not all breasts are the same. So some of them will have glandular tissue, making it uh, the more glandular tissue, the harder it is to see a mass. So we need to use other, to supplement with other ex uh, modalities so that we can evaluate for any masses. So this is the CC view. This is the MLO view. You can see the pectoralis muscle. You can see the, the, um, the breast tissue, fatty tissue, the skin, and the nipple in profile. And it's adequately done because you can even see the infraclavicular region, inframammary fold, sorry. There are small nodes here, the axilla. So sometimes you can be able to pick the, depending on how it's done, pick any enlarged auxiliary nodes for further evaluation on, on ultrasound. So for the diagnostic imaging, um, you can use ultrasound mainly for those who are less than 40 years and with complaints of a mass and diffuse bilateral breast pain, diffuse breast pain. Ultrasound is also used for those who develop a mass during pregnancy, because we don't want to expose them to any radiation, especially in early pregnancy. And then also during lactation. During lactation, remember because of the milk, so the breasts tend to be very dense. When you do an ultra, um, a mammogram, the pickup rate uh, tends to go down. So for those ones also with a clinical breast mass but with a negative mammogram, we still want to evaluate them using a, an ultrasound. 
just to see possibly could be fat that you're not able to pick, but with an ultrasound, you can be able to interrogate the breast, especially when the clinician tells us that these are, they are feeling this mass at a particular um, region, we need to emphasize and look at that area even better. So also for the male patient who presents with a mass, you know that um, um, uh, breast cancer can also occur in the, in the male patient, but you need to start with an ultrasound just to see whether it is get, to rule out any gynecomastia and then proceed from there depending on what, what is found. Then we also use ultrasound to correlate with the mammogram that's by rad zero just to, uh, for further clarification of the, of the abnormalities. We can also use ultrasound to characterize the auxiliary nodes, both their shape, their size, their vascularity, the number, and also ultrasound is used in guiding a biopsy and in wire localization. So these are some of the indications where we use um, ultrasound as part of diagnosis. So its advantage is it's non invasive ultrasound is easily available. It's not that expensive. There is no radiation involved and the you get your results almost immediately because the report is written immediately. Then the disadvantages, the main disadvantage is ultrasound is user dependent and it's prone to misuse in the wrong hands. Um, depending on the qualification of whoever is doing the scan, it is important that sometimes you might get the wrong reading or the wrong probe used for the examination of the patient. So this is, this is a disadvantage of ultrasound, but otherwise it is good. It is when used with the right um, personnel. So these are some of the um, images that you can see on, um, on an ultrasound. This is basically a simple, a simple cyst. You can see there is no, there is no um, echo within. It's an echoic. And you can see that there is this edge and uh, edge shadowing and with this enhancement. So this is basically, and the margins are well defined. So this is basically something benign. We can also be able to tell the orientation of the lesion. Benign lesions tend to be wider than taller, and we can see it's a solid mass. So from a mammal, we can be able to separate whether they are solid masses or cystic masses and any other features. A mass also that is not very well defined. You can see there is um, growing into the into the duct. So this is this is likely to be a malignant, um, a suspicious mass because there is this irregular, uh, irregularity noted of the mass. And also sometimes the mass can be very well defined, but there's this just this small area of indenting. This mass can easily be um, mistaken to be um, a benign mass from, uh, from imaging. But remember at the end of it all, we need a histology to be able to confirm whether the mass is actually benign or malignant. So always, the back stops with uh, histology. We also all, we need to take the masses also for a histological diagnosis to confirm. Just because a mass looks benign, it can also have uh, suspicious cells within. So a diagnostic mammal is mainly used for those um, above 40 years with breast lumps that are palpated by themselves or the referring clinician. Those ones with focal breast pain, focal breast pain as opposed to diffuse uh, breast pain that is non-cyclical and um, discharge that is unilateral, spontaneous, bloody and watery. Those ones also need to undergo uh, a mammo, especially if they're above 40 years. And also we do a diagnostic mammo if we've done a uh, screening mammogram and found an area that, need, that is of concern. So we don't classify, when we are screening, basically we don't uh, give a BIRADS 4 or 5. During a screening program, you need to evaluate that mass further uh, using, a, I mean, using other supplementary views and using possibly ultrasound, MRI, and even going to imaging. So we still do the standard MLO view and CC views. Other views are done depending on what we find on the standard views. This include the compression views, magnification views, extended the mediolateral oblique views, the auxiliary views, the cleavage views. These are some of the additional views that would be done depending on what is found on the, on the MLO and CC views, just to assist in generating a report. Then we have a digital breast tomosynthesis. This is a 3D view of the breast, which helps in further characterization of the mass lesion. 
It's normally acquired in um, multiple angle views are acquired then reconstructed into three thin, thin slices. And this helps reduce superimposition that can obscure lesions. So when we use tomosynthesis um, to evaluate as an adjunct to mammography, we are able to increase the detection of invasive and carcinoma in situ. Yeah. So these are the various breast densities that we encounter during uh, imaging from the fatty to the dense. A lesion that is put here being dense, it's very easy to miss a lesion when the breasts are this dense. So for uh, densities C and D, sometimes you need to uh, go further and do ultrasound or even do MRI depending on the, on the risk factors that the patient presents. So the clinical history <coughs> also plays an important role so that we can be able to work up the patient accordingly. Uh, these are just mammogram images showing um, benign, this is a well-defined lesion with a halo, and this is a macrocalcification. So the lesion was also done an ultrasound and it was basically a solid as opposed to, um, as opposed to cystic lesions. Sorry, I didn't have any images of, the, of showing any malignant lesions, but this is, uh, this was to show just a benign lesion. So MRI is the indications are mainly when you're planning for conservative breast surgery. We also do MRI in those um, mammographic or occult tumors. Now it's MRI is superior to mammograph, mammography in assessing the breast, people with uh, dense breasts. Because yeah? as you've seen before, if there is a mass, the, the breast density is too dense, it's very easy to miss a mass. So we'll use an MRI just to be able to define further. MRI can also be used for preparative staging. And um, it can be used for further evaluation of the tumor size and in detecting uh, the invasive component in uh, DCIS, depending on the enhancement patterns. It's also used when there is suspicion for multifocal disease, um, which is not confirmed on the, in the mammal or even on ultrasound. And it can be used to detect uh, additional tumor foci in the same breast or even on the opposite side. Sometimes, in fact, in our setups, you're also getting a lot of um, bilateral breast cancer. So it's important, especially for the high risk uh, patients to look at that. And then in the presence of malignant- Dr. Abu, maybe, yes? Dr. Abu, maybe for the sake of time, maybe you could uh, uh, go to that summary. Okay, so basically um, I'm about to finish. Um, Okay, this was a patient with a dense breast and basically we are seeing with this density, it was difficult to pick the, the lesion which was picked on MRI. You can see that lesion there that was enhancing and there was a smaller lesion on the opposite, on the opposite side. So basically MRI is good in pe uh, picking up lesions in the dense breasts. So as uh, Dr. Mariam said, we need to provide the pertinent history. This is just a summary of what she, she presented to us, the important uh, findings, clinical history that you need to give us. Uh, in KNH, we have this uh, mammography questionnaire that just facilitates us in getting that history, especially when it's not being provided. I'll just leave it there, I'll not go through it. And these are some of the things that we are looking for when you are reporting masses, calcification, any distortion, asymmetry, skin thickening, nipple retraction, axillary nodes, and the enhancement pattern on MRI. So um, Dr. Mariam talked about also the um, localization of the, of the breast lesions as the clock. It's the same thing also in radiology when you are giving our reports, we need to localize so that you are speaking the same language. And then we normally give the information with BIRADS, huh? classification where we talk about the breast tissue, any comparison and any abnormalities. Then we give um, final categorization. This is basically um, a summary of the BIRADS classification and the various recommendations depending on what classification category has been given. So these are some of the um, intervention procedures that are done. You can do a stereotactic biopsy, uh, uh, tomosynthesis guided biopsy, ultrasound guided or MRI biopsy. Then you also need to do, well, a core biopsy, is, a needle core biopsy is done for most lesions. And then FNAC for suspicious nodes. Some of the challenges that we encounter are technical factors, positioning, maybe limited availability of the various modalities, patient factors, breast densities beyond our control, patient anxiety, discomfort, 
clinical factors, especially when inadequate clinical history is given, wrong examination requested for the patient, and sometimes lack of adequate personnel in reporting, especially in clinic, clinical uh, screening setups. So basically, that's it. I think it was a very, um, it's difficult to summarize breast imaging in 20 minutes, both screening and um, diagnostic, but basically that is what I had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbuvi, for a very good presentation. Uh, I think we, we will go to Professor Lucy Mushiri. See my screen? Yes, Prof, we can see. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege to, to be part of the, this Breast Cancer Awareness um, Month initiative by the, by the cancer, National Cancer Program. Thank you very much, Dr. Malenya, for inviting me to speak. I'm a pathologist in the uh, Department of Human Pathology uh, School of Medicine. Uh, but of course, working in Kenya National Hospital. That's really the outline of my presentation. Um, doc both Dr. Mariam and uh, Dr. Mbubi have covered very well, so that, uh, I really don't have um, to repeat anything. Um, I think they presented excellent um, uh, presentation, made excellent presentations. Um, I thought I would start here um, with a preamble about uh, why programs fail. And programs, you may wonder why a pathologist is talking about programs, but it's because programs um, is a continuum of activities and we are all, as healthcare providers, uh, we are all part of that continuum. Um, so from screening, to the clinician, um, the radiologist, the pathology, the surgeons, uh, palliative care, all the way. Um, we are all part of uh, programs in early detection and diagnosis and ensuring um, um, good clinical outcomes and reducing mortality from breast cancer. Um, so WHO says programs fail because even us as physicians, uh, we share, or, or some of us share the pessim pessimism um, of our patients regarding the cur curability of breast cancer. So we may not necessarily uh, encourage our patients uh, who come with a breast lump to go for further investigation. Uh, a lot of patients also believe that modern medicine has no cure for cancer. So once you have a cancer diagnosis, uh, whether it's clinical or after investigation, um, that going to hospital um, will not help you. And therefore they are likely to seek practitioners of alternative medicine, traditional med medicine, um, medicine men, faith-based healers, and all sorts of other um, providers. Um, but we know that um, it's essential for early detection programs uh, to, to educate both the public and the naysayers in, in, uh, among the healthcare providers and professionals. And the wider the early detection programs penetrate the population, then information is, um, uh, is disseminated and the impact um, leads to acceptance of screening and diagnosis. So the first uh, tool that we use um, in pathology is for um, a tool for early diagnosis. Um, and um, this is usually done after detection of breast lumps, after clinical breast exam and mammography. 
uh, and once uh, it's a simple diagnostic tool, just really needing a needle and syringe uh, and literally nothing else and some slides and some alcohol for fixation um, can be easily used um, in, um, in, in a field setting, in a clinic setting, um, in a health center. Uh, we've tried all these modalities and once um, healthcare providers from clinical officers to MOs, uh, even nurses uh, are taught how to take this sample, they can actually make excellent smears. Um, there's uh, a study we did uh, a few years back looking at training um, medical officers uh, and clinical, um, clinical officers um, to actually take smears, um, um, do FNAs and make the smears um, and send the slides to where a, pathology, a pathologist is, whether it's a, a county referral hospital or Kenya National Hospital. Well, at uh, that time we partnered with Aga Khan and we got excellent uh, material. So we can provide um, um, early diagnosis using fine needle aspiration um, at uh, even primary level um, uh, facilities. And when the results of clinical assessment, mammography, and FNA uh, with cytology are combined, the accuracy can be can approach 100%, um, as already has been discussed. So um, these tools, three these three tools are referred to as triple test assessment. And I think Mariam said she will elaborate uh, this further. So I will not spend more time on it. When we come to tissue diagnosis, once the clinical suspicion has been um, has been raised, and the imaging has um, also um, confirmed that indeed there is a lesion, then we need to take a tissue a biopsy. And basically, there are two types of specimens that um, uh, we 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 take: the true cut or needle core biopsies and then the incisional and excisional biopsies. So let me elaborate um, some of this. The core needle biopsies, which now has become the sort of primary tissue uh, biopsy that is, is, uh, is uh, standard, um, is just they, they use a gun um, um, with a hollow needle, uh, forget about the Spanish, I think it's Spanish or Italian, but uh, just to illustrate that um, uh, a hollow gun needle uh, with a gun to just take, and then you get cores of tissues um, from the lump. And this can be used uh, for a palpable mass, um, as well as an area that is suspicious that can only be seen on uh, a mammogram or other imaging tests. Uh, so a non-palpable abnormal finding uh, at imaging. Um, so advantages of core needle biopsies, um, when it is done by an experienced um, provider, radiologist or surgeon or a trained physician, even in some clinic, uh, breast clinics, even pathologists do um, a core needle biopsies. As long as you are trained, then it can be highly accurate and can take very good uh, cores. Uh, it's quick, it doesn't require um, uh, any surgery. <clears throat> and in fact, for, <clears throat> for other tests such as hormone receptors, uh, it is good because it's a small biopsy, it will fix very quickly and well, and you all those problems with fixation, um, um, uh, 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 ameliorated by doing a core rather than taking a, a huge chunk of tissue. And a core biopsy, if, um, if, if breast cancer is, is found, um, then it can give important information about the tumor type, um, the tumor grade. We can do hormone uh, receptors as, as well as uh, prognostic um, tumor markers. But there are disadvantages of the core needle, core needle biopsies that the needle can miss the tumor. I know this is probably more an area of uh, Dr. Mariam, uh, but it's important for pathology as well uh, because we struggle 
um, if we don't get a good biopsy and then we are wondering what do we do. So it's important that we receive uh, um, adequate tissue that is representative of the lesion uh, clinically evident. So the needle can miss the tumor uh, and no more tissue may be sampled. And this gives uh, rise to a false negative report. And, and this um, happens more, is likely to happen when the biopsy is done without the help of breast imaging. So when um, the clinician um, or the surgeon first seeing the patient maps out, as we have been told, where the tumor is, then you are likely to go directly there, especially if they mark, as well as if the, um, the radiologist marks the area, uh, if she's, she or he is not the one taking the biopsy. Um, the resultant is that a false, is a false negative result delays the diagnosis. And then of course, you know what happens to our clinical outcomes. For non-palpable abnormal findings, a false negative result can occur in up to 4% of image-guided core needle biopsies, uh, but much less in the palpable masses. Uh, core needle biopsies are unable to reveal the size of a tumor. Um, um, sometimes you're not even able to see that there's uh, invasive tumor if you only have ductal carcinoma in situ because the core is small or sometimes you're not able to tell that there's invasive uh, disease. So these are some of the disadvantages of working with a small uh, tissue uh, biopsy. So we come to uh, surgical tissue biopsies. Um, it's not always that um, there's a gun to do a needle core biopsies or somebody trained, uh, but there may be somebody who can do, uh, take a surgical tissue biopsy. An incision of biopsy is the biopsy that removes only part of the abnormal area, as I have illustrated here with this uh, white square. Um, so you don't take the whole, sometimes it's a huge mass. So you're only sampling part of the abnormality, but an incision of biopsy, particularly if you have a small lesion, uh, then you can do, uh, you can remove the entire abnormal area. Um, which is represented in this entire um, uh, square. And you may include um, a margin of normal tissue around the tumor, depending on the reason for the biopsy. If, for example, there is a high suspicion for malignancy, then you want to do a wide excision. And it is very important to tell us, uh, to indicate in the requisition form, what type of biopsy you have taken because if it's a wide excision biopsy, then we need to ink um, the, the, the surgical margins and we can tell you that the excision is complete. Uh, very important in terms of uh, clinical staging. Um, once we've, we've looked at the tumor under the microscope, then we have um, typed it. We have said whether it's a ductal carcinoma or a lobular carcinoma. In today's presentation, I opted not to go into the details of how we determine whether it's lobular or ductal or apocrine and all the other types, because um, I was told we have a general um, uh, audience and I didn't want to make all of you pathologists. So, so I, I steered away from that. So once we have decided whether it's lobular or ductal or any other type of um, histological type of tumor, then we grade the tumor. And the grading is um, the description of the tumor based on how abnormal the, the tumor cells are, because this is going to be important in, in predicting um, the biological behavior of the tumor. And we use various standard parameters that over time have stood the test um, of, of objectivity in scoring. And each of these three parameters uh, is given a maximum of a score of three. For example, um, um, in this example, we have the, the Nottingham grade for a moderately differentiated um, uh, cancer, uh, which was given a score of seven uh, overall 
or grade two of three. Grade two of one is uh, well differentiated, two is moderately differentiated, and three is poorly differentiated. And we use these three um, attributes to score. So if there is duct or tubular formation um, then, uh, uh, and hardly any, then it is given a score of three. If the tumor cells um, are markedly pleomorphic or there's variation in size and shape and, and color of the tumor cells, um, then it is given a maximum score of three uh, in this example. And if there are only a few mitoses and we actually count mitoses, um, in 10 high power fields, um, then depending on how many they are, then we score them. Uh, so this particular case was given a one out of three and the total score, if you add three plus three plus one is seven. And that is um, a, grade, um, a grade two uh, tumor. Um, so um, this is a sample report for a left breast core biopsy. We always want to state which breast it is. So laterality is very important in the report. Sometimes we don't get, we are just told breast core biopsy. We are not told whether it is right or left. Uh, so it, that is an important clinical um, bio that must be in the requisition form. Uh, so the microscopy in this um, example um, was multiple tissue cores infiltrated by a poorly invasive uh, ductal carcinoma. And we use uh, various uh, grades um, that have been modified over time. And that most commonly used is the Elston Nottingham modification of the so-called Bloom Richardson um, grading. So poorly differentiated gets a grade of three of three. And we always give a summary, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, there was exuberant desmoplastic reaction. These are just histological descriptors of the tumor. A mild host lymphocytic reaction. Again, this, these are important to show that the body is actually mounting an immune system to the presence of tumor. Uh, in this example, the tumor involved more than 80% of the cause submitted. Um, overt lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion uh, are not seen. So that would be the microscopic, microscopic description. And then a conclusion is given, left core biopsy, breast core biopsy, invasive ductal carcinoma in this example, given a grade three of three. Um, the hormone and prognostic markers were all negative. So this was a triple negative report. I'll address that in a little bit. And then um, the next uh, slide is the summary. So there's always a summary after the description and the conclusion. Um, and the summary, again, we just uh, a quick glance of all the parameters that we use, specimen type, a needle core biopsy, the histology shows an invasive ductal carcinoma, not otherwise specified, not otherwise specified because we could specify if it was not the common garden type of invasive ductal carcinoma, there are other types. So Nottingham grade, um, again, giving all the details, greatest tumor dimension um, in the core biopsy, uh, a maximum of 13 millimeters of contiguous uh, infiltration, the extent or volume of tumor in the cause, more than 80% of cause were involved in this example. The presence or absence of a ductal carcinoma in situ must be stated and what type it is the presence or absence of lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, because all these are important in uh, prognostication, the presence of microcalcification, uh, host lymphocytic uh, response, whether present or absent, and graded whether mild, moderate, or intense. And then um, the, the results of the prognostic markers and receptors. So that would be the summary of a core biopsy or even a mastectomy um, specimen. It basically follows the same uh, format. So these are just histological examples of uh, ductal carcinomas. Uh, this is called a comedotype. Looks like the brooch that women wear on their lapel. Uh, this duct is expanded by um, 
um, tumor cells and the central necrosis looking like a brooch. And this is a papillary carcinoma because it has uh, these finger-like projections with, often with tall uh, tumor cells uh, arranged on the periphery of this cause. These are just some examples of um, typical um, carcinomas. Uh, so we come to prognostic uh, markers. Um, 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 the first, the, the com most common one that we, we do is the estrogen receptor uh, marker. And, and this is more um, an indicator of a response to therapy rather than uh, uh, as an indicator of prognosis. And the clinical um, discovery of the importance of estrogen uh, in the influence of uh, breast cancer was actually dates back to 18, more than 100 years, 1896 by George Bitson. Wow. When he showed the, the, the beneficial effects of um, oophorectomy in two of his patients who had- Professor inoculum. Mushiri. Yes. Uh, we we kind of running out of time. If you could, ask it. okay, I'll 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 hurry up. Okay, so uh, so it it has a long history, and the importance of reporting estrogen receptor status is that it has um, implications in targeted therapy. Um, so we do both estrogen and progesterone receptor markers, and we know that uh, the presence of both. Uh, correlate best with response to anti-estrogen uh, treatment. Um, tamoxifen is the most commonly um, uh, used um, and all the others, um, there's some, some references there. And we do the immunostaining on paraffin fixed tissues. So we don't need to take another biopsy, we just use the blocks um, of the tissues that we have. Um, Estrogen, uh, progesterone receptor tumors, uh, negative tumors um, are usually moderate to poorly differentiated and, and tend to have a poorer prognosis. Um, and some of the histological examples that tend to be negative include metaplastic tumors, adenoid cystic tumors, apocrine, arsenic cell carcinomas, and so on, um, and often occur in premenopausal women. Um, a good uh, percentage uh, of uh, women with primary operable breast tumors are ER negative. So it's important to, to remember that. Um, so this, this are just examples of the immunohistochemical um, staining for ER and PR staining and scoring. So this um, on the left of your screen is invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, showing a plus three uh, score of estrogen receptors. Both estrogen and progesterone receptors are nuclear um, staining. Okay, so you can see it's just the nuclei uh, that are stained uh, in both this um, a score of three, so strong nuclear staining. And the other um, immunohistochemical marker that we use, which is a prognostic marker, I won't really go into this, is hard to everybody knows. It's really a marker of um, prognosis. So overexpression of uh, HER2 or human epidermal growth factor um, portends um, a poor prognosis. And the, the, it's associated with comedo carcinomas and aggressive invasive tumors. And that's really all I'm going to say about it. And unlike the ER and PR um, receptor marker, it's a membrane, a nuclear membrane stain. So you can see that it stains on the outside, the nuclear membrane. This is a, a three plus uh, HER2 staining, uh, uh, two plus and a one plus um, nuclear staining. So um, like the other speakers before me, uh, pathologists also require that clinicians give us complete clinical information um, in the requisition form. Um, it's important to mention whether it's right or left. Um, age is often left out. Please don't write A for, for age 
it's very annoying and, and it's not very useful. The type of biopsy you, you have uh, done, um, if there has been previous treatment, because if there has been previous treatment, then that changes the histology quite significantly. And some changes that we will see on histology, we can report based on previous treatment, whether chemo or radio. So without adequate clinical information, then you get an incomplete report. And it's also difficult to report on clinical pathological staging for excision biopsies and mastectomy specimens when you don't have adequate um, clinical information. So please uh, help us to help you and let's work as a team for better, best clinical outcomes for our patients. Um, lastly, there is um, um, uh, uh, this webinar coming up, I think next week, uh, Thursday, a week from today, on the why, when, and how of HER2 testing. So I encourage it's on, on Medscape. I think it should be interesting, uh, an expert panel. And thank you very much um, for the privilege to to give this talk, Asante Asana. Thank you, Professor Mushiri. Um, now we will uh, have uh, Dr. Mariam for the last 10 minutes to just indicate for us um, uh, the benign breast masses and uh, briefly the, their clinical presentation and what we should be doing with them. Thank you, Dr. Oduka. So uh, why are we talking about benign breast masses when we are in the Breast Cancer Awareness Month? So one thing is that um, breast, benign breast masses are common in all age groups. And some carry a risk of malignancy, either in the same lesion or future risk. And the most common is actually a fibroadenoma that we've seen some questions about it. And it has a varied presentation. And some patients end up um, missing a malignancy diagnosis for a benign one because they're treated as benign, yet it's actually malignant. So, uh, I've classified them based on the risk of developing cancer. Those with a uh, very low risk of developing cancer are um, include simple fibroadenomas, simple cysts, and traumatic fat necrosis. Those with a moderate risk include complex fibroadenomas and cysts and introductal papillomas. I'll explain more about each and every one of them in the following slides. And those with a high risk of developing cancer include the atypical hyperplasias, ductal or lobular. So the clinical presentation for fibroadenomas, it mostly affects women uh, between the age of 15 to 35, but it may be found in older women. And they may also be multiple, they may be bilateral, and some end up being uh, very large. And Sometimes they may be associated with pain, especially cyclical nostalgia, that is uh, right before their menstrual periods. And uh, usually they are highly mobile on examination. As opposed to breast cysts that usually affect women between the age of 35 to 50, and they may also be multiple, and they may be painful, especially if there's a rapid growth. And uh, clinically, it's difficult to distinguish them from solid masses. Now, traumatic fat necrosis, you'll find these patients come to you with a history of trauma or surgery to the breast. The trauma may actually be very trivial that the woman doesn't remember herself. And on examination, the, uh, the mass would be firm, uh, an irregular mass. So you might think it's actually, it could be cancer. And um, it often requires a biopsy for you to confirm that it's uh, traumatic fat necrosis. Introductal papillomas, um, these are papillomat uh, like, um, papillomatous lesions that grow within the breast uh, ducts, and um, they may also be solitary or multiple. They commonly present with a nipple discharge, and usually uh, the nipple discharge can either be clear or it can be bloody. Uh, remember the bloody nipple discharge I discussed earlier, and they're rarely palpable. So the patient, these patients usually just come with a nipple discharge. And the important thing about introductal papillomas is that they may actually have a, a foci of DCIS that later on becomes 
um, invasive cancer. Now, the atypical hyperplasias, these ones are very important because the relative risk of developing cancer over a lifetime is five times that of the normal population. And the absolute risk is actually at 10% in 10 years. And uh, they usually present as a mass and they may be asymptomatic and they're detected only on the screening mammogram, hence the importance of screening programs. So what do you do with a breast mass? A patient has come with a breast mass. What we do is the triple assessment. The triple assessment consists of history and clinical examination, followed by imaging, followed by biopsy. Clinical examination, remember, any breast mass, we must exclude cancer. So you do the same clinical examination that we discussed, the breast mass, you must, mention, uh, you must uh, define its um, diameter in centimeters or in millimeters, and uh, how far is it from the nipple and uh, its location on an o'clock face. And then, uh, of course, you're going to examine both the breast and the axilla. After this, you go to the imaging. And uh, Dr. Mbuvi uh, told us about uh, the imaging. So if you're going to do a diagnostic mammogram, it's done for women above the age of 40. Anyone below the age of 40 is done for a breast ultrasound. That's because of the breast density. For some women above the age of 40, they may also need a complementary ultrasound based on the findings on the mammogram. Now the biopsy, you can either do FNA or the core, however, we prefer that you do a core biopsy for any solid lesion or the complex cyst. Um, that is, so the complex cyst is one that has solid components within the cyst wall or um, also thick septi. And when you do a biopsy for these cysts, you have to biopsy the solid component and this can only be done using image guidance. So how do you manage all these masses? The simple fibroadenoma, its natural history is that um, usually these are hormone sensitive and that's why they become painful more prior to menstruation. And they persist during the reproductive age and they regress after menopause. So if a woman is like 45 and she has a fibroadenoma confirmed on biopsy to be a fibroadenoma and imaging is also concordant, then you may allow this woman to um, you may do conservative management because after menopause, you can tell her this will regress uh, automatically. Now, if at any age, this fibroadenoma is asymptomatic, then we, what we do is simple observation. Observation meaning you, in, you do interval examination every six to 12 months so that you detect any changes and you can also repeat imaging when you detect any changes. The imaging can also, be detect, uh, can also be done as a routine after the six months or 12 months so that you, you may find changes that are radiological and not clinical. And if those changes develop based on the uh, findings on that, of that imaging, you may repeat the biopsy because there's that slight chance of it developing cancer later on. Now, giant fibroadenomas are those that are more than four centimeters, and these ones may require excision because they cause a cosmetic disfigurement of the breast. The other reason is that some of them may actually be not fibroadenoma and they are phylloidous tumors. Now, the disadvantages of excision, because you find some patients with simple fibroadenomas, they are not symptomatic, but they are undergoing excision. Now, the reason we don't advocate for excising any fibroadenoma is um, because it can cause damage to the ducts affecting breastfeeding later on. It can cause scarring that is seen on imaging and that scarring appears suspicious on imaging. So if, if you have a patient who's had excision of a breast mass in their history, you must also include this in the request form for the imaging because the radiologist will see something, they will think it's, um, it's uh, suspicious, but the reality is that it may just be uh, scar tissue from the previous excision. Now, simple cysts, we also observe them if they are asymptomatic, you do an interval examination and imaging after six months. If it is stable, then you may increase the interval. And if the patient starts to develop any symptoms, they can come back. You may do some aspiration of symptomatic ones. Those are the painful ones. 
So pain usually develops when there is rapid, sudden growth. And if that happens, then uh, aspiration is recommended and you have to aspirate to complete resolution, which is usually confirmed with ultrasound. And it's best done, the aspiration is best done using image guidance. But if you don't have, if it's palpable, it's okay, it can be done under palpation uh, guidance, but you must confirm that the mass has completely disappeared. Because if it did not disappear, that is um, a suspicious finding. So if you have a bloody aspirate or you have a persistent mass after complete aspiration, then a, bio, a core biopsy must be done under image guidance of that area. A complex fibroadenoma, uh, these are commoner in older women and uh, they contain uh, cystic areas and calcifications. And these ones have a higher risk of cancer than the simple fibroadenoma. So you must also do a core biopsy before you excise them. Complex cysts, these ones contain the solid components. I've already talked about this before. So uh, in, uh, biopsy of the solid component must be done. And based on the biopsy, you do the subsequent management. Now, intraductal papillomas, co-biopsy is recommended because of the possibility of harboring a focus of DCIS. And the co-biopsy would need to be done under image guidance because um, most of them are impalpable. Now, the, indicate, the surgery that's indicated for it is duct excision. Atypical hyperplasia. Now, these ones are the ones with the higher risk of future malignancy. They are best managed with the breast multidisciplinary team that includes the surgeons, the oncologists, the, um, the radiologists, pathologists. The entire team is needed to decide how to go about these masses. They would require surgery that is wide local excision. Now, this is not excisional biopsy. This is a lesion you've already confirmed on core biopsy that is a typical hyperplasia, whether ductal or lobular, and then you do that wide local excision. And um, now removing it does not reduce the risk of cancer because the cancer risk remains in the rest remaining breast tissue and also in the uh, contralateral breast. So there are other cancer reducing uh, cancer risk reducing strategies that are followed by the MDT team. Including, um, including like uh, chemo prevention, uh, use of tamoxifen and the likes, but it has to be under the guidance of the MDT team. So the take home message from my presentation is that the triple assessment is the key to correctly diagnose and manage breast masses. Excision of a breast mass must be preceded by a core biopsy because we've seen instances when you clinically examine and it feels like a fibroadenoma. Imaging also shows it's mal it seems benign. And then someone is taken in directly to surgery. Histology comes back as invasive cancer with positive margin. So that's what we try to avoid with the triple assessment. Do all the investigations and then excise the mass. And lastly, uh, the breast, sorry, the breast MDT team plays a key role in the appropriate treatment and follow-up of high-risk lesions, that is the atypical hyperplasias. So these are my references, and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Mariam, for that brief uh, uh, presentation on benign breast diseases. And uh, just to uh, introduce the panel again, we have uh, Dr. Mariam Badawi, who is a general surgeon based at the Aga Khan Hospital in, the, in Mombasa. And uh, we have Dr. Lenita Mbuvi, who is a radiologist uh, here in Nairobi. And we have uh, oh. Professor Lucy Mushiri, who has introduced herself. Is a professor of pathology at the Department of Path is, uh, Human Pathology, University of Nairobi, and Kenyatta. Uh, myself, I'm Dr. Daniel Ojuka, surgeon, uh, breast surgeon, uh, based at the University of Nairobi and uh, Kenyatta as well. And thank you, everyone who is present, and the questions that have been asked through uh, the chat uh, place. 
I think uh, majority of them have been answered back. Uh, but I have um, some that I will be asking. Maybe we start with Mariam. Uh, just, uh, I think some people are asking to you mention uh, or do a comment about phylloides tumor. Maybe we can start with that. Okay, so uh, phylloides tumors are, uh, let's say they are like a type of a sarcomas, but they can be benign, borderline benign and malignant. And they histologically, they usually, they have a bit of similarities to fibroadenomas, but they have more cellular component than um, the connective tissue component. And the issue with fibro, uh, phyloidis as opposed to uh, fibroadenomas is that phyloidis, when they're excised, they must have uh, an excision margin of about two centimeters because their recurrence is quite high if you have less of a margin. So, uh, and for these patients who have these giant fibroadenomas, the reason we said we need to exclude uh, phyloidis in them is because um, some of them may actually be phyloidis that is detected after the excision. Initially, the core correctly identifies it as fibroadenomas, but then the histology after excision comes back as phyloidis. And so the margin becomes very important to, for, for us to predict the risk of recurrence for these patients. Thank you. And, and I think that's uh, earlier on you had indicated that uh, part of the reason why you want to exercise gi uh, excise giant fibroadenomas is because some of them would be phylloidous tumors and um, uh, yeah. other, 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 other tumors of that nature. And, and, and usually the difficulty with the phylloidous, I think one of the reasons why it is important to do uh, triple assessment, especially pathology, is that uh, phylloides tumors is one of those tumors that, yes, as uh, Mariam says, can be benign or moderate or malignant. The problem is if it is, uh, even when it is benign, the, the recurrence rate is very high. So if you know from the word go that it is uh, phylloides, you want to give it a wide margin so that it doesn't come back. Because if, if, if you just, go uh, with with the tumor margins and then it comes back, uh, you will have to re-excise and re-excise sometimes five times, sometimes they may even require chest reconstructions. It is very important that we do the triple assessment and, and diagnose some of those things early. The other question that I've seen is the role of progesterone and estrogen in cancer development. I, I wonder whether Professor Mushiri would help us answer that question. Um, uh, we, we know that uh, tumors that are positive for estrogen and progesterone uh, receptors um, do tend to to have a better response to um, targeted endocrine therapy. Um, so I, I think that's why we do it uh, for pro prognostication um, and to indicate uh, uh, choice of therapy. However, having said that some of some breast tumors that are negative, um, I think up to 5%, of tumors that are negative for ER and uh, PR do respond to um, uh, chemotherapy such as tamoxifen. Uh, so that's why we do them. I didn't go um, into the science of the, or the biology of estrogen and progesterone receptors, uh, but as I, I just indicated that um, more than a hundred years ago, um, um, George Bitson noted that um, patients who had inoperable breast tumors and uh, had oophorectomy actually did better. Um, that means um, the estrogen endogenous uh, 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 hormones, estrogen and progesterone, 
do promote uh, breast cancer the same way that um, use of hormonal contraceptives is a risk factor for uh, breast cancer, as well as women who are on hormone uh, replacement therapy after menopause. Um, so these are uh, tumor promoting um, um, uh, um, hormones or factors. Um, and if we reduce um, uh, the influence of these hormones on, on the breast, then we reduce um, the risk for, for, for breast cancer. I think that's simply put, that, that's what I can say about it. Thank you, Prof. Somebody's also asking the role of um, C15.3. Uh, yeah, those are some of the lesser uh, tumor markers um, that are not commonly used because, again, they are not strong indicators for, um, for prognosis or, um, or response to therapy. Um, so uh, yeah, there, there are many, it's not just, it's, I, I highlighted the ones that we commonly do um, um, uh, that are important for uh, treatment options and prognostication. So there are many others. Estrogen and, and progesterone receptors, by the way, are not only just positive in breast cancers. So they, some other tumors as well. Um, so we are selective in, in maximizing, because remember this, this tumor markers uh, are expensive. So you don't want to use them when you don't need them. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are indications um, and there are some times when you really don't need them, you're just making it expensive for the patient. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I don't know whether Mariam can finally take one about night shifts. All right, so um, uh, there are some studies that show that um, melatonin is uh, sort of protective against breast cancer and melatonin is produced from the pineal gland. And um, the night shift work, that is basically the lack of night sleep, it reduces the amount of melatonin in the body. And that is the connection that is related to why night shift work increases the risk of breast cancer because of reduced levels of melatonin. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Len Leonida could help us just make some comment on ductal ectasia. Leonida, Dr. Mbuvi. All right. So, so ductal lactasia is um, uh, enlargement of uh, ducts and usually um, present when there is a periductal inflammation that then leads to fibrosis and then uh, pulling away of uh, pulling a part of the the duct, making it large and can lead to, of course, because of the, 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 the inflammation that was already there, there will always be uh, some form of discharge. Uh, and, and that discharge can range from uh, the normal, clear, to straw colored, to green, even dark, or can even be bloody. So the presentation can be can, can, can be varied. And, and sometimes they don't have to really present with the with the with the discharge, sometimes you do an ultrasound and they tell you there's a rectasia uh, that does not necessarily require any 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 intervention at all. 
Uh, Nelly or Moll is asking if one breast has cancer, is there a risk of the other? Of course, if you have a breast cancer in one, there is a high risk. That's why I think Dr. Mariam was talking about, uh, and, and Dr. Mbuvi talked about surveillance as well. Uh, so it is, it is important. Uh, usually contralateral prophylaxis mastectomy is discouraged. Uh, there is no really evidence uh, to encourage that. And, and so it, it's not something that you will want to advise your patient to remove their breast if they have cancer in one. I think I don't see any other question on the panel uh, here. Um, the question about uh, products that increase um, uh, breast cancer, I think the, 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 the products can be a, a soy product increased risk of breast cancer. I have no evidence for that. We can't talk about that unless any of the panelists have come across any evidence that soy products increase No, actually, there's no evidence that shows soy products are either protective or increased. The, the, the assumption is that they protect, but there's no evidence to support it. All right, I am not seeing any other question. There is a question about late nights, early wakes. Uh, I think Maria has answered that. Um, so I think uh, we can't go back to that. And I want to thank everyone, the panelists and the people who participated. I think uh, the maximum number was about 300. Uh, thank you very much for the attendance and for your question. They are excellent, um, excellent instructions. Thank you very much. And as was stated yesterday, these this, uh, webinars continue. Uh, uh, next week, we will be having one on, um, on Tuesday on 27th, uh, so please, you're welcome. Uh, invite your friends as well. Those who have left their email, uh, we will uh, endeavor to send you um, the, 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 the presentation to your emails. So thank you very much and uh, have a great week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night.